how God saved his people from extinction at the hands of uh, a wicked, wicked man called Haman by his marriage as a Jewish woman to the Babylonian king. So it's a good, good read, and it's very, very short, but it's celebrated as the festival of Purim, meaning lots, because Haman couldn't decide which day to exterminate everyone, so he drew lots for the date. So yesterday was the date. So these things, what are they called again? Anyway. Purim cookies. Yeah, yeah Purim no, cookies. I'm going to try pronounce it, okay? okay. These are Haman's ears. Haman's ears. Because <laughs> in the old days when they executed someone, they chopped their ears off first. So these were considered in the Jewish like trophies. So instead yeah, of them dying, it was Haman that was executed instead. There's a lot of prophecy okay. because Esther, 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 when she asked her country to fast, yeah. she lived on poppy seeds and water. Yeah, so that's oh. mine. <laughs> Anybody so want one? We'll pass it around and if you want one. They're very sweet. They're super sweet. Yeah. So that's traditional for Purim. Okay, are we... We're good? Oh, well, I've belated welcome to those who are... Oh, yes, yeah, we'll have the lights. <laughs> My Purim cookie here for later. So, welcome on. Let's go to prayer. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless you, Lord. The songs we sang reminded me that you are not dependent on our strength, but on your own. As you said, when there was no one left, you worked salvation for yourself. By your own right hand, your own zeal sustained you. Your own righteousness guided you. You did it for the sake of your name, for the sake of your covenant, to maintain and fulfill the promises you had made because you are not like a man that you should make a promise and not keep it. You are not like men that you should lie. In the song, the question was posed, you know, choose this day whom you will serve. For as for me and my house, as for all of us, Lord, we will serve you. We want no other. We're not interested in the gods of men. None of them can save. In the end, as it is written in your holy scripture, the labours of the nations are but fuel for the fire. It is vanity, in vain, that they struggle to make heaven on earth. This world stands condemned. Nothing can save it. But we can be saved out of it. Because of your grace, because of the blood of the Lamb, because of your Son, Yeshua. So now, Lord, as we turn to your word, remember your covenant, write your law in our hearts and minds, open our eyes and ears, to understand, open our minds, Lord, and instruct us, because you said that a man would not teach his neighbour to know you, but you yourself would teach us, that all would know you. It's your covenant promise, Father. So we pray and ask in Jesus, and by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would sanctify us by your word. Lord, those overseas, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would raise up men able to instruct among them. We pray, Lord, for all those that we've known for so long, we ask you to bless them with wisdom, with understanding, and to lead them firmly by the right hand of God. Because of the danger of the age, and because of the times we live in, shepherd us closely. We pray, Lord, that you would go ahead and, Lord, you would see the wolves coming and that the wolves would never see us. They would only see you and run away. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So tonight's topic is, for me, easy. <laughs> so we're just going in chronological order through John, but I'm a bit tired. So I'm quite pleased with that God agreed with me and gave me an easy topic. So we're staying in John 1, and we're just going to, at the end of this, you won't know anything astonishingly new but lots of things that you already know you'll know hopefully better does that make sense so uh, yeah so i'm not expecting that you'll discover things you never knew but oh you know maybe let's see so from last week remember we we're in john 1 and chat uh, sorry verse 43 just follow me there uh 
The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, he says, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked, and come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. A mouthful. So I remember from last week, our main question was, does God just pick some people, but not others, to save? Like the Calvinists say, you know, it's called, um, got to have a head now, like predestination. So the idea that there's, if, if God hasn't chosen you, there's nothing you can do to be saved. And I, as I said I, in the last week, I'd had two people from overseas messaging me really distressed saying, I don't think I'm chosen. You know, Satan was really on their case that no matter that they were devoted to Christ, that Satan was trying to convince them that they had they were not part of the elect. You know, and in the Calvinist view, if God hasn't chosen you, if he hasn't called you, there's nothing you can do to be saved. Predestination, right? All of that is sick, evil, and unbiblical. The Reformed churches would throw bricks at me for saying so. I don't care. It's not biblical. And last week we saw how if it's too hot, someone just turn the temperature down a bit on the blast. Oh, okay. So you'll remember how we zeroed in from here. I'm just this is the very speedy review of last week. Remember how we zeroed in and how did Jesus know that Nathaniel was a godly man? before they ever met. Remember Nathaniel says to him there, he says, how can you say that about me? We haven't met. And Jesus <laughs> says something that sounds cryptic. He said, I've already seen you under the fig tree. Before your friend brought you here, I've already seen you under the fig tree. Now if you're reading that in English, you're going to assume he means that Nathaniel was having a rest under a fig tree and that's where Philip found him, right? Jesus is speaking. It's a, this is a midrash, okay? And if you look at the, halfway down the page, you'll see the prophet Micah, Micah 4 verse 4. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. Now, if we were doing a study on Micah, you would discover that like most of the prophets, Micah starts off outlining all of the nation's sins and everything that's going to happen to them as a consequence of their sins. But by the time we get to chapter 4, he prophesies that after a time of discipline, you know, like exile, that after a time of discipline, salvation would come, that God would show mercy again and that he would destroy Israel's enemies and that in the end, you get what it says here. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. It's a picture of sitting in peace in your own land. No danger like that. Right? This is what Jesus was saying to Nathaniel. I've already seen you in Micah 4. Micah 4 is a future event. Micah 4 is talking about the kingdom to come. Micah 4 is talking about heaven. What people wrongly call heaven, right? 
the kingdom to come. That's what Jesus was telling him. I know you're going to be there because I've already seen you. How can Jesus already have seen him when he hasn't been yet? This is the point, remember? And you all, you all got the question right. We experience time. What is it? Well, it starts with C. Chronologically, one event after the other. So for us, time is this linear thing, like the ticks on your watch. This one, then this one, then this one, then this one. We just experience time going in one direction, one tick at a time, one event after another in a straight line. Right? Kairos time is harder to explain, and it's a whole study, as we did a whole study on it, but because we're just summarising, think of it as time as God sees it. And I always explain it like this. If you are a roast chicken in God's oven and you need to be roasted for two hours, you're counting off, you're experiencing 120 minutes, one minute after the other. But the time on the clock in God's kitchen has no relation to the time you're experiencing in the oven, does it? The time on God's clock in the kitchen is whatever it says on the hands. Two different experiences of time. From our perspective, it's those 120 minutes. From God's perspective, it's what's happening in the kitchen. God has already seen the end of all things. Remember the title for one of the titles for Messiah is he's the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In Isaiah, he actually specifically says that he has seen all things, even to the end. You know, I've seen the end from the beginning, or the beginning from the end. You know, what does that mean for us? This is just revision, remember. It means the invitation to be saved is for who? Everybody. Elsewhere it is written, it's God's will that all should come to repentance and be saved, right? That's what he wants. All. He doesn't pick some people and not others. All are invited. That's why Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, it will never be me who drives them away. How many exceptions are there to anyone? None. Right? And we saw that whilst all are invited, only some come, and not all who come stay. So you get three kinds of people. People who never come, people who come for a while, but once the heat gets hot, you know, once it gets hot in the kitchen, they bail. And then what's known as the remnant, those who persevere to the end and are saved. But it's all our free will. God never forces anyone to be saved. Does that make sense? So that's what we took from that. It was just a like, crash course of last week. And of course, Nathaniel was very helpful for explaining that. However, we're not quite done with Nathaniel. So leaving last week behind, at the bottom of page one, we'll pick up in verse 44. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethesda, or Bethsaida, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and of whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked, Come and see, said Philip. So what's the deal with this town, Bethsaida? Well, the first thing is, Peter, Andrew, and Philip all come from there. Three of the key disciples all come from this one little village. It's a tiny place. It's an Aramaic name. It means the house of fish. Or alternatively, a place of fishermen. So what kind of people did he find there? Fishermen, unsurprisingly. Right? Why? Does anyone know where it is? It's quite close to a big pond, better known as the Sea of Galilee. 
okay? <coughs> so it's on the coast of the lake. I suppose you still call it a coast, don't you, when it's a lake? So why does it matter that the place where these guys who are going to be uh, disciples come from, why does it matter that it's called a house of fish? What does Jesus say to them in Matthew 4, verse 19? Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you, what? Fishers of men. I'll make you fishermen for men. So the first disciples he calls comes from the town whose name basically means the place of fishermen, the house of fish. Why does God do things like this? Well, it's for our encouragement. He wants us to see his design in it. That it wasn't accidental. He didn't leave anything to chance. Not a thing. He wants us to recognize. Remember what we said about the Gospel of John? It's not like the other three. This is the Spirit's testimony about the same things the other three write about. But not from human's perspective. John is giving the Holy Spirit's perspective of the same events. So it's the spirit that wants us to notice God's design in what happened. The first three come from, the first three who are going to be fishermen and men come from a town whose name means a house of fish or house of fishermen. Then you notice Nathaniel is told that they had found the one Moses spoke about. So they thought refers to Jesus as the one Moses spoke about. If you turn over to page 2 at the top, let's have a read of that. Deuteronomy 18 and Moses speaking, Moses says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you and from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. A prophet like unto Moses. So that's what Philip's saying. How important is that concept to Jews, that one like Moses had to come? Important enough for the apostles to also mention it, Acts verse 3. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in Israel ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then. And turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From among your own people, you must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. So it's important enough for the apostles to be appealing to the unsaved Jews. God can forgive you for crucifying Jesus because, in fact, his crucifixion had to happen to fulfill prophecy. Remember, the lamb has to be slain. The Passover lamb has to die. Right? So God can easily forgive the Jews for something that actually they had no choice about happening. Right? But they have to acknowledge that he's the one Moses said would come. And Moses, it's Moses that says, look it up in Deuteronomy, it's Moses that says, if anyone who does not listen will be cut off from his people, that's a Hebrew way of saying, be very, very dead. Physically, spiritually, no hope. Right? You must listen to them. Now something to pay attention. That's all Jesus said to him, right? I've seen you under the fig tree and... So all the, what information has Nathaniel got? His friend says, we found the one that Moses said would come. Well, you know, if you all came running and saying, I've just met Jesus in the mall, what would you think? You'd be thinking, really? 
right? You wouldn't immediately assume that it was true, would you? So we can't base Nathaniel's reaction off Philip's claim without, because in fact, you see, what does Nathaniel say? From Nazareth? What good thing can come from Nazareth? So as he's, he's going with his friend, his friend said, you have to come and see. So he's going, but the, the, the story tells you that he's going in the same way you'd probably go down the mall to see this Messiah expecting Krusty the Clown instead, you know? So he's not very, he's not rushing there really expecting much, is he? It's because the guys from Nazareth will cover why that's important in a minute. All Jesus says is, I saw you under the fig tree. That's all he says. What's his reaction? In the third paragraph on page two, he's described to Nathaniel as Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. The son of Joseph. Who's Joseph? He's a man, he's a carpenter, right? Everyone knows Joseph, Mary, his wife, Jesus, his son. So if Nathaniel is only expecting a prophet, is there anything strange in the fact that he's got a human father? So up to this point, what would Nathaniel be thinking? Either my friend's crazy, or he's right, in which case it's another prophet. And he's from Nazareth, and his dad's name's Joseph. Right? So, even here, Nathaniel was not expecting anything supernatural, anything beyond human, is he? And then all Jesus says to him is, I've seen you under the fig tree. Take note of what he says next. This guy who's sceptical of something from Nazareth. At best, he's assuming a prophet, you know, with a, with a normal human dad. And instantly, look how Nathaniel answers. We're going to break it down. He says, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. When he calls him Rabbi, remember what we talked about last week? Instantly, he calls Jesus Rabbi, and it's in a personal tense. So, like, my rabbi. Acknowledging him as his rabbi instantly. Ask yourself, what clever piece of evangelism did Jesus just use? What sign and wonder did he display? Nothing. What clever sales pitch did he give? Was there a free set of steak knives that came with it? No. All he did was say, I've seen you under the fig tree. Straight away, this guy, something happens to him. Something goes off inside him that's not natural. It's not based on just ordinary human reason. All doubt, all doubt has flown, and he probably doesn't even understand why, but in his innermost being, he knows who he's talking to. He says, you are my rabbi. You are my high priest. You are, what does it say next? You are the son of God. No one calls him the son of God for ages in the story, right? This is right at the beginning. Minute one, Nathaniel says, you are the son of God. No, no ifs, buts, or maybes. You are the king of Israel. You are the high priest you are the king. You are the son of God. There's only one person that's those three things at once. And that's Hamashiach, the Messiah. Do you understand what the Spirit's showing us? This is a revelation of God to Nathaniel. This is not the work of men. This is not some clever trick of, you know, like those... those uh, when they're selling your stuff on TV. None of that. It's very important to grasp what happened. 
instantly, he knows. I don't know what, it doesn't say what Philip's reaction is, but I bet Philip was really shocked. Because he just thinks he's found like a great prophet. And his mate Nathaniel, who was as sceptical as anything when they were coming, is suddenly falling on his face in front of Jesus after one second, saying, you are the son of God. But that was a shock for him. Anyway, let's move on. Notice, what did, um, sorry, get back up the page where it's supposed to be. Remember what Nathaniel's objection was? He's from Nazareth. How can anything good come from Nazareth? Right? What's the big deal with Nazareth? Well, it turns out a lot. Where must Messiah be born? You should all know this without looking. The bread of life must come from the house of bread, which in Hebrew is Bet, house, or Shem, bread. Bet Lachem, Bethlehem. Right? So the bread of life, of course, is born in, you know, that loaf comes out of the bake shop at Bethlehem. So how come we don't know him as Jesus of Bethlehem? That's a serious question. Why don't we call him Jesus of Bethlehem? Why do we call him Jesus of Nazareth? Think about that. He's born in Bethlehem. Messiah must come to Bethlehem. Remember when Herod was inquiring of the wise man? When Messiah comes, where will he be born? And they consulted the, the Torah and said, he might, and they quoted from Micah 5, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And that's what set Herod off trying to kill all the babies, right? Especially at Bethlehem. Right? So why don't we call, why don't we talk about Jesus of Bethlehem? <coughs> you ever thought about that? would make more sense with them. So, we have two strange things. We call Jesus by a town that he wasn't born in, and we see that for some reason, coming from Nazareth is a particular problem for Nathaniel. Let's look at why. So we know that he's born in Bethlehem, but remember, he has to go on the run. Remember the spirit says to his parents, you must hide the child. Where do they hide the child? Egypt. Egypt. Right? Mangaraki. No, Egypt. 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 So, after a while, Herod dies. And the spirit tells them that it's safe to come back because Herod is dead. Right? So he comes out of Egypt we see in Matthew 2.15 where he stayed until the death of Herod and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt I call my son that's in Hosea 11 right? out of Egypt so he's out of Bethlehem but now he's out of Egypt why don't we call him Jesus out of Egypt you know but we don't, do we? What happened when they got back into the land out of Egypt? They should have gone back to where they're from, shouldn't they? Did they go there? What did the Spirit tell them? It's not safe yet, because Herod's lunatic psychopath brother, Archelaus, is on the throne. Right? So you have to go and hide somewhere. So let's see if anyone knows. If you're hiding from a Jewish king in that nation at that time, where's one place in the land where you probably won't go? Where's Jerusalem? Yeah, Jerusalem. Yeah. Where's one place no self-respecting Jew would go in the land? Yeah. 
Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles, where the Samaritans are. Where is Nazareth, do you think? Galilee. God directs them to go and hide and for the boy to be raised in Galilee of the Gentiles in the town of Nazareth. Margaret, Margaret, just there. So, so they go from Egypt to the part of the Jewish homeland that the Jews themselves don't like to go to. Does anyone know why it's called Galilee of the Gentiles? What's a Gentile? Glim, right, in the Hebrew. So what does it mean? So it literally translates as nations, right? So we do our Old Testament study, but I'll just summarize it for you. God created the 12 tribes by starting with two people, Avram and Sarai, right? Abraham and Sarah. And he says, I will make you a nation. So they weren't a nation. He made them a nation. And their descendants are the 12 tribes of a new nation known as Israel. Right? What made them his? A covenant. He swore a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob concerning the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, right? Goy, or Goyim plural, means anyone who's not in the covenant. So all other nations, it doesn't actually really mean geography. You know, it doesn't mean England or else Jamie would be in trouble, right? It doesn't mean that. The meaning of it is I have my covenant people and those who are not my covenant people are the nations, the Goyim. Remember how I have told you a million times what happened to Israel when they refused to repent? What did God do to them? Remember that when the nation was divided, split into two, into Israel in the north, the kingdom of Israel, and in the south is the kingdom of Judah, ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. What happened to the ten tribes when they refused to stop worshipping pagan gods and, and following their particular pleasant queen Jezebel? He sent the Assyrians. They were carried off into captivity as slaves to Assyria, right? After a long and brutal captivity there, it was brutal, right? The, the people who went into captivity were all dead, not one living, right? It's their children who are there. When God ends the captivity, not for those who went into it, they died there, right? The problem is their children grew up in Assyria, Jewish parents living in Assyria with Assyrian culture dominating everything. Not only that, but their parents were apostate anyway, remember? That's why they're in captivity. So how Jewish do you think the kids were? Not very. How much of their own faith do you think they really understood? Not much. Right? Here's another one for you. What do you think they spoke when they came back? A kind of slang Hebrew because it was half-half with Assyrian. Assyrians speak a very similar language to the Babylonians. So after the Babylonian captivity between what the people of Samaria, Samaria is the land where Israel was, that's why they're called Samaritans, people of Samaria, right? So when they came back, they spoke a kind of a slang Hebrew when the, when the captives came back from Babylon, they spoke a kind of slang Hebrew, and the two versions of slang Hebrew clanging together and forming a new mixture is Aramaic, the language that Jesus almost certainly spoke to his disciples in. Okay? So Aramaic, that's where it comes from. It's the kind of dialect of Hebrew 
that's like half Hebrew and half the language of the Chaldees, the Assyrians and Babylonians. Okay? Right. I'm not sure how I got onto that topic. But never mind. So, God causes them to go and hide. Oh, sorry. Backing up. The whole point. Now he missed it. So when they're in captivity in Assyria, what happens to the land? It's empty. Right? Apart from Assyrians. But Assyrians needed people to work the land to pay taxes. So the whole land that had been the northern kingdom filled up with foreigners. Free land, cheap land, all you do is pay tax, come here, have this land, it's all good. Right? The original inhabitants are a bit preoccupied being slaves in Assyria. That's how it became Galilee of the Goyim, the Gentiles. Even when the captives came back after Assyria was destroyed, the place was permanently populated with non-Jews as well as Samaritans. So for the pure Jews down south, even though they are technically Jews up north, they don't think of them as that. They think of them as corrupted and bent and not really Jewish. And that's why when you're reading about the Good Samaritan or the Samaritan woman at the well and things like that, you always get a sense that like the Jews are a bit, you know, like that. That's why. Okay? They were always treated as second-class citizens. So that's why God hid Jesus up there. Herod wouldn't think to go looking for the Messiah of the Jews. In Galilee, what would the Messiah be doing up there with those Gentiles? <laughs> you know, good place to hide. And the town he hid in is Nazareth. So in Matthew 2, it says, He went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, plural, prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, what do you think Nazarene means? He shall be called a Nazarene. So you'd be tempted to go, what's well, in the prophets? Let's look it up. Everyone's been trying to do that for 2,000 years. Guess how much luck they've had. Zero. There is no prophet that actually says this. None of the prophets actually say that Messiah will be called a Nazarene. But John is adamant that the fact that he has to be a Nazarene is explicitly required by the prophets, plural. And this is a bit of a toughie, but can anyone think how you can have it that it's not there in the prophets specifically, and yet John is insisting that it is? I'll give you a clue. It's to do with the fact that it's prophets plural. One prophet says he'll have a long, long trunk. Another prophet says he'll have a small tail. Uh, yet another prophet says he'll have four legs like tree trunks. Another prophet says he'll be massive and have skin as thick as a plank. Another prophet says he'll have enormous tusks. What are they saying? He's an elephant. Right? None of them say he's an elephant, but collectively... They've described an elephant. Do you understand? This is the, how it works. That's what John is saying. No single prophet says it specifically. But the, but the sum total of everything the prophets say about Messiah leave it necessary that he be a Nazarene. Do you understand? So it never says it in so many words in any one prophet. But just like my elephant example, you arrive at the conclusion he must be to be this and that and that and that and that and that. What else can he be? 
Well, in the case of my example, it has to be an elephant. Nothing else will fit, right? For John, nothing else will fit except he must be a Nazarene. So what does a Nazarene mean? Well, remember the first rule of Midrash is the simplest and plain meaning is the meaning, right? So what do you think Jesus of Nazareth might mean? In the plainest, simplest, no tricks. From Nazareth. He's from Nazareth. Ten points, Aranial. <laughs> if I had a chocolate fish, I'd give you half. <laughs> yeah. So, in its simplest, purest, plainest form, you know, no bars, no questions, no old bar. It just means he must come from Nazareth, he's from Nazareth, right? So let's see, based on, remember we were reading from the scripture before? So let's see how he's doing. He has to be born in Bethlehem. Tick. He has to come out of Egypt. Tick. You know, he must be a Nazarene. Tick. Right? Jesus is ticking all the boxes to be Messiah. But let's look more closely at why it matters or what it might mean. So if you get Bible scholars, you know, the big heavy duty guys, they cannot agree. So when the heavy duty scholars can't agree, it's usually because they're trying to make the answer to the overthinking it, right? So remember my example of the elephant? Is the leg wrong? No. Is the trunk wrong? No. Why? Because he's all of those things and more. They are parts of a picture, right? So that's how we need to approach the understanding of Nazarene. Because the prophets speak in part, the meaning is in part as well. So let's look at the different things it could mean and see if, in fact, it might mean all of them at once. I'll give you a clue. It does mean all of them at once. Okay, let's see how. So the first place for anything Hebrew, the first thing is to look at, the, is there an actual root meaning of the word? It usually gives you a, a clue. And the problem with this word Nazareth, or Nazareth, is it's of uncertain origin, but there's a couple of likely ones. So if you look at, oh, we're on page three now, number one, you'll see Isaiah, put my glasses on so even I can see, Isaiah 11, verse one. A shoot will come up for the stump of Jesse. Where's Jesse? Got a stump? Yeah. Keep an eye on your stump, Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From its roots, a branch will bear fruit. Okay, so this is a messianic prophecy, right? He's prophesying that the Messiah will come. Who's Jesse? The father of King David, right? So from that root, Messiah must come. What do we know about Messiah? He must be a king like unto David and the line of David of the tribe of Judah. So that's essentially what Isaiah is saying, right? So as simple as that, it's a complicated, midrashic way of saying when Messiah comes, his lineage must trace back to Jesse through David. Does that make sense? The thing is in Hebrew, the word for branch, he has to be a branch that bears fruit, right? So Messiah himself is the branch. The Hebrew word for branch is, I'm going to wait, Netzer, N-E-T-Z-E-R, Netzer, right? So Nazareth, so not actually how you say it in Hebrew. So Netzer can be the could be the root of that Netzaret. Right? So Nazareth might mean the place of the branch. So grammatically that could work. It's not and most probably the greater weight of percentage wise of academics favour this one. They say that that's what it means. That it 
points to the branch. That would make sense, wouldn't it? He is the branch. Understand? And his root has to be right back where God gives the promise. Right? So he has to be able to trace his roots back to the promise through the line of the king. So that's tick for Jesus. That's why, incidentally, you find the genealogies in the gospel. Yeah, have you tried to memorize the genealogies? If you do, good luck to you. <laughs> I sure can't. So that's one possibility, right? But it's also entirely possible that it has a different Hebrew root as the word, which is Nasar. Nasar, as well, number two now, Nasar means to guard or to keep watch over, which would make the meaning of Nazareth like a guard tower or a watchtower, a place from which a guard keeps watch. So what will Messiah do? He's the shepherd who watches over the flock. Right? He is a shepherd of the people. He watches over God's people, Israel. So that fits as well. So it can be the branch that fits. It could be that he's a watchman, the guard over the flock. That fits. Both of them have good cause to be get a tick, but neither can discount the other. So you have to do what? Accept the possibility it's meant to be both. Because he is both. He is the branch and he is the watchman. You might be thinking, why, why even care? Right? Who cares what Nazareth means? Right? So if you meet someone from the Philippines or if you meet someone from America or if you meet someone from Europe and, and you say, I believe in Jesus, they'll say, oh, you're a Christian. If you meet an Arab or a Jew and say, I believe in Jesus, will they say you're a Christian? They will not. An Arab will you say, oh, you're a Nasrani. Nasrani. A Jew will say you are not seen. Not seen. Nasrani is Arabic for Nazarene. Not Nasrani. Nazarene. And not seen in Hebrew is Hebrew for Nazarene. For the first two or three centuries, no one knew what Christian meant. The, the, the believers were the believers of the Nazarene. Jesus, the Nazarene. And his followers were known as Nazarenes. Up to now, if you're Arab, up to now, if you're Israeli, modern Hebrew word for Christian is, in Hebrew, Nazarene. That's what they see you as. A follower of the Nazarene, the guy from Nazareth. So, even though no Bible scholar can tell you with laser light accuracy precisely what the meaning of the word is, or precisely where in the prophets it says that because it doesn't ever say it completely in one place, the fact that the, these two great Islam and Judaism are both crystal clear in their minds that that's what he is, that's what we are. It obviously was meant to mean something. Do you know And John himself says he must be a Nazarene. So, so far, we've got, it could be that he is the one Isaiah spoke about, the branch, the Netzah, or that he's the watchman, both fit. If you can't choose, take both. Remember my elephant example? Is he a trunk? Is he a small tail or a fat neck? Actually, he's all of those things. Don't pick one or the other. Take them all. Take the whole elephant. Does that make sense? I hope. So there's a third one. So those two, if you are into if you're into language, either of those work as potential roots for the word, right? There's a third version that is much harder to make fit 
in terms of language, but not in terms of calling. And so this is less likely, but I include it on the list. And that comes from Numbers 6, 1 to 6. You can look it up later. If you're a Hebrew man, and for a particular reason, for a particular season, you wish to be especially considered especially holy, right? So you know like sometimes you go, you decide to fast? So you need to be especially close to God for a season so you might fast, something like that? Well, you could do something beyond that. You could take what was called the Nazarite vow. And those Nazarites were sometimes also called Nazarenes. Right? The word, the Hebrew word for it doesn't quite fit as well into the name Nazareth, but it's a possibility. So this is what you had to do if you are if you took a Nazarite vow. And my wife, shall I, well, let's check. Am I allowed to take a Nazarite vow? <laughs> If I want, good. That means I never cut my hair again. Right? Not my beard. <laughs> not my beard, not my hair, my head. Right? You just it just got longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. Right? Oh yes. Yeah. I'll read it after I just so, no cutting your hair. You're not allowed to touch or eat or drink anything that came from a grape. Not grape juice, not wine, and not even wine vinegar. Nothing at all from the fruit of the vine. Can you remember that? Fruit of the vine, right? Forbidden. You're not allowed to touch a dead body or go near a dead body. Right, and a, a few other things. Those are the main ones, right? So someone walking around like that with their hair everywhere and not drinking and you know avoiding funerals and all the rest of it, it was like an extreme fast. You know, it was like beyond fasting, and it might last. Uh, there was a prescribed number of days, but sometimes people took it longer. Sometimes people took it for years and years. Generally, it might be for a few months. Right? Thing is, though, if you ever did it, you were considered a Nazarite for the rest of your life. Right? Especially whole. Right? So, is Jesus of Nazareth meant to mean Jesus the Nazarite in this sense? We have a problem straight away. He drinks. He deals with dead bodies. Right? Raises the dead, Lazarus, etc., etc., right? So during his ministry, the answer has to be no. But if you go down uh, where did I put it? Hang on. Oh, I might, be, I might have put it... Oh, I'll just do it off the back because I think I'll put it on a different page. What happens at the Last Supper? I did put it... Sorry, I did put it further along. I just remembered. So just hold that thought and we'll arrive at it. Think of the Last Supper. So for the time being, he can't be a Nazarite, right? So there's no record of him having his hair all over the place and he drinks and he deals with dead bodies. So during ministry, definitely he's not a Nazarite. But do you know anyone who is not more set apart to God than him? No. So he's actually more set apart to God than any Nazarite ever was, or ever could be. Pretty hard to be closer to God than actually being God. So, hold that thought. Next thing is this business of Nazareth being in Galilee. What's the big deal? And I explained it to you a little bit already. But have a look at John 7. 
Nicodemus, John 7 verse 50, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? So Nicodemus is trying to defend Jesus or at least get him a fair hearing from the Sanhedrin who just want to basically kill him out of hand, right? All these uppity Pharisees and Sadducees in their pride and arrogance, they, they bark at Nicodemus. Are you a Galilean too? Remember what I said before? These guys look down on Galileans like dogs. These are fellow Jews, right? They're still, their parents are still the ten tribes. They're still Abraham's children. But for these Jews in the south who didn't go into exile in Assyria and conveniently are ignoring the fact that they did go into exile in Babylon, for them, these people in the north are like subhuman, right? Dirty, unclean things. That's why this is an insult to Nicodemus. Are you a Galilean as well? That's a real insult, right, in that place. Look into it, they say, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So all these who are the religious leaders of the day, how smart were these guys? Pretty smart, right? You don't get to be Caiaphas without knowing your Bible, without knowing the Torah, right? You don't get to be one of these priests without knowing the Torah. You know, they're supposed to be the leaders of the temple, the religious leaders and guides of the people, etc., etc. So they are saying categorically, adamantly, that no prophet ever came out of Galilee. And they'd know, wouldn't they? Can you guess what comes next? Are they right? They must be right, surely. They're the big Jesus, aren't they? Let's have a look. When Jesus... Uh, when Jesus said that they will get a sign, these people seek a sign, but I tell you, the only sign they will get is a sign of Jonah. Jonah. What was the sign of Jonah that God gave them? Just as Jonah was three days in the whale, Jesus would be three days in the tomb and rise again. The sign of Jonah, right? So the prophet most associated with Jesus rising from the dead the principal sign to the Jews that he's the Messiah is the prophet Jonah, right? Look at bottom of page 3, 2 Kings 14, verse 25. Long story before, then it says, Spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hefer. The prophet from gath Hefer. Jonah's from gath Hefer. Anyone like to take a wild guess where Gath Hefer is? Um, it's in Galilee. <laughs> Remember, these guys just said no prophet ever came from Galilee. It couldn't possibly be any good come from up there. No, no, no. God would never send us anyone from there. Right? <laughs> They're completely wrong. Not only is there a prophet from Galilee, it's that prophet. Do you understand? The one whose time in the fish points to Jesus in the tomb for three days is also from Galilee, not far from Nazareth, in fact. Do you see these religious people? What blinded them? They should have known this. It's their own book, right? What blinded them? Tradition, tradition, tradition. Pride. They're so busy being superior to anyone from the north. They're so busy being superior to Samaritans and anyone from Galilee that they overlook the fact that they completely got that wrong. Something they should have known and made complete idiots of themselves. It doesn't say what Nicodemus said, but I can imagine what he's thinking, right? 
Spoil vain. Spoil vain. Yeah, get me out of here. Yeah, okay. So, but it's worth noting. Remember what I said to you at the beginning? You won't learn anything new-ish tonight, but hopefully what you already knew will just come <coughs> sharper. Right? Sharper. And that's a good one. Not just were they wrong, but the prophet they were wrong about is the very prophet Jesus said they would have the sign from. The very one. Over on page four. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Ah, okay. So we're going to finish with Nathaniel and we're going to finish, oh, almost finish with Nathaniel. Finish with the Nazarene thing now. Like this. Remember that, uh, my, uh, our elephant? So is it, is an elephant just a trunk? No. Is it just a tail? No. Is it just four legs? No. It's all of those things, you know? So that's how we must understand that he must be a Nazarene. I am firmly settled in my spirit that that's how God intends us to understand it because all of these cases are almost equally plausible. Oh, the Nazarite one. Sorry, I nearly forgot it. At the Last Supper, right? At the Last Supper. What does a Nazarite have to do? He can't deal with any dead bodies anymore. Once he's once Jesus dies and is resurrected, how many dead bodies will he deal with after that? None. <coughs> Only live ones. He's a shepherd of his flock. who are all alive and cannot die. Right? Does he cut his hair? This is one you won't know the answer to unless you're very, very clever. No. <laughs> okay. So, so I've had I've had women ask me should they have their hair long like it says in the Bible? Like Paul says in the Bible, right? Because it explicitly says that Christian women should keep their hair long. That the habit short is not right. Okay? And you think, why? And if you go to a Western church, they'll say, oh, no, that's just first century custom or some cultural thing. Oh, no, it's completely wrong. Completely wrong. So because we're talking about women, you will, of course, know that the answer is to do with a man. And his name is Samson. What was the deal with Samson's strength? Where did it come from? His hair. His hair. Remember when his hair was cut? His strength disappeared. His protection went. <clears throat> Remember? When his hair was cut, he suddenly became vulnerable. You understand? Not literally, but God had told him that his hair was a symbol of God's presence with him. Why? Where's your hair? Yeah. Oh, unless you're Jamie. Excluding Jamie, where's most of your hair? <laughs> It's on top. Right? This is your head's covering. It covers your head. Right? So those of you who understand about Christian marriage, God ordains that the man as the head of the house a covering over his wife. Not just in authority, but in protection. His prayers protect his wife. His, the presence of God... The presence of God protects her. Do you understand? That's why Paul says that you shouldn't cut your hair short because it's exactly like Samson. The long hair is, the, is a sign to others that you are covered, either by your husband or if you're unmarried, by your father, and if he's dead already, then by your uncles or whoever the elder men in your life are. God puts as your head's covering over you. So your long hair is meant to be a sign to others that your head is covered. Cutting it short has a Hebrew meaning. It points to Samson. That if you cut your hair short, as you're giving a sign that you've stepped out from under that authority, that your covering is removed. Okay? Now, I know that's not on your mind when you cut your hair, but that's I'm explaining what Paul means. Does that make sense? 
It's meant to be a sign to other people that you are in submission, that you are under God's order of things. So that, so when you read that, understand that's what it means. It's nothing to do with culture, nothing to do with fashion at all. Do you understand? So come back to the Nazarite, which is it has to be a guy, right? So the same thing applies to him. That's why he can't cut his hair. Because it's like Samson. So in this time of his Nazarite vow, where he draws especially close to God, like Samson, he will not cut his hair. Because it's symbolic, it's a sign to other people that he's coming completely under God's authority and no one else is setting himself completely apart to that covering. To that head covering God alone. Does that make sense? So of course his hair is just his hair. But it's 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 symbolic meaning to other people. And that's exactly what Paul means about woman. It's not that if you cut your hair short you'll suddenly come and go all week. Unless you, oh actually that happens, isn't it, when the hairdresser gives you the bill? <laughs> <laughs> See, so it's true. You cut your hair short and your knees go. How much? Oh no, that's your husband going with it. How much? <laughs> anyway, whoops, hang on, one moment. Hang on, trying to escape, you won't get away. <laughs> <laughs> so, here, the, oh, give me that before it's, it's going to slide off. And... So, coming back to Jesus, at the Last Supper, he actually in a sense, takes a Nazarite vow at the last minute. His, he's never going to cut his hair again. What does that mean? Well, he had to leave his heavenly realm and take on bodily form, right? He Remember we said he had to reduce himself. Though he's God, suddenly he couldn't just translocate. He had to walk or ride a donkey. You know, he limited himself. He had a haircut. But going back to heaven, in the sense that it means, I'm not talking about literally, but the meaning of it, never cuts his hair again. His authority, his head covering, there's no one over him. He's other than the Father, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Father of the Trinity, right? So in that sense, he never, gave, he never takes another haircut. Because when he comes back, does he limit himself at the second coming? No, he comes back in full glory, remember? No haircut. How about the not touching dead bodies? We covered that. Because now he just deals in the living. Right? He is the shepherd of the flock who never die. His people live forever. No more dead bodies. Right? What about, and why are we at the Last Supper? What about the fact that he can't drink? Has he joined AA? Has he signed up for the Salvation Army? <laughs> no. What does Jesus say? I'll just hold you on that thought because we will get to it at the wedding in Cana. Okay, but hold that thought that Jesus will get to be doing the, the last bit of the Nazarite vow at the Last Supper, we'll see what is it. And on that note, it's time to go to a wedding. <laughs> so, sort of leaving Nathaniel behind, in John 21, where Nathaniel reappears, he's not mentioned in the rest of the Gospel again until John 21, it says there specifically that Nathaniel is from a town in Galilee called Cana. So that's where Nathaniel's from. So back in, and as we finished John chapter 1 now, so on the beginning of John chapter 2, we're on page 4, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. So John 21 tells us that's Nathaniel's town. So we can only speculate, we can only guess, but maybe, because it's so soon after, maybe the wedding is one of Nathaniel's relatives. It's quite possible. Okay, Jesus' mother was there. Who's that? Mary. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. 
When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby six stone, uh, stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus, that's about 65 litres. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, with his mother and brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Verse 13. When it, was, uh, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Blah, blah, right? Why have I added that last bit? Because it tells you when the wedding happened. The wedding happened with Passover in view. You know? Is it a couple of days before, a week before, a month before? But Passover is like in view. It's the next thing they're going to do is go up for Passover. Right? So this tells you when is Passover in terms of the beginning and the end of the year? When is, is it the beginning or the end of the year? It's spring. Scripturally, what does God say? when he commands the first Passover in Exodus. He says that you will celebrate the Passover on the 15th day of the month of Nisan. It shall be to you the beginning of the year. Right? Because it's the beginning of God's overall calendar for human history. Right? Everything begins with the Passover. That's why the New Covenant begins with that Passover, etc., etc. Right? This wedding is just before the Passover. Where does that make it in terms of the beginning and the end of the year? Almost at the end, right? It's really important to understand. I'll repeat. John is giving you the Holy Spirit's perspective of events. So things like this is what he wants us to see. The wedding is at almost at the end of the calendar year, or the, of the yearly cycle. And it, we know that because the beginning of the year, Passover, is what the next event is. Right? Not only that, there's no other festivals in between. That means that trumpets, booths, and Hanukkah have already been. Right? So it's in the gap. It's winter. It's in the gap between the end of the autumn holidays and spring, the beginning. On the overall clock, on the overall calendar, where are we when the when the last of the autumn holy days are fulfilled behind us, where are we? What is? Let's go to Sukkot, right? Booths, tabernacles. What is the teaching? Remember, you have to live in a booth for seven days, and the the fathers have to tell their children when God brought us out of Egypt through the wilderness. We had to live in booths, 
temporary dwellings. You know, and on, by the seventh day, the green branches that you make it out of in the Israeli heat will have all turned brown. The whole thing will be looking really manky, ready to fall down from the heat, right? And you quote from the scripture, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever, right? So in other words, this booth will fade away, but the word of God will not fade away, right? The whole picture of birds is, in the wilderness, we live in temporary dwellings. What's the opposite of a temporary dwelling? A permanent home. Where's our permanent home? Heaven. Heaven. Well, more precisely, the kingdom to come, right? The new heaven and the new earth, right? So follow me, so follow me here. The beginning of the year for us is way history, 2,000 years ago. The, the Passover that matters, the beginning of the final <coughs> cycle, it's 2,000 years ago in some, right? The fulfillment of trumpets, booths, and Hanukkah is to come because they have to do with the second coming, right? Particularly tabernacles, when you are no longer... What happens at the end of the seventh day? You don't stay in your booth anymore. You move into your house. Remember, you only stay in the booth for seven days. Why seven? Picture of picture of something that a cycle that's complete, right? So for the seven days, you live in a temporary dwelling. At the end of it, you go back into your permanent house. It points to what? The time when. Our wilderness journey that we're in now will end. Our temporary dwelling, even in this thing, ends. And most importantly, you move into your permanent eternal home. And you move into your permanent eternal home as a single person? Ah, trick question. In terms of other human beings, get ready married people, in terms of other human beings, when you appear in the kingdom, are you married or single? Single. Single. Why? Jesus tells us specifically there is no marriage in heaven. That you will be as the angels are. Right? So just be... There's only one marriage in heaven. Only one husband, Jesus. Everyone else is the bride. Right? Do you get married to him on earth? are only betrothed. Where does the wedding take place? Well, the most important wedding guest has to be present. Who's that? More important than that. More important than that. Can't happen unless he's there. The groom's father. The groom's father. It has to happen at his house. I'm going ahead of you to my father's house to prepare a room for you. But don't worry, I'll come back and get you. And then I'll present you to him, a bride, spotless and without blemish. The wedding of the lamb happens in heaven. After the rapture, that's what the rapture is for. The resurrection and the rapture takes the bride to the wedding. Do you understand? Do you see what the Spirit's pointing to here? This wedding isn't just a random wedding. This wedding is pointing to another wedding. It happens at the end of the year, pointing to the after Hanukkah even. Therefore, it's pointing to the time after the autumn holidays are fulfilled. Heaven. A wedding in heaven. Keep that in mind when we look at what's actually happening here. The disciples have been invited to this wedding. Who's invited to the wedding of the Lamb? Only the disciples. If you're not a disciple, you're not betrothed. If you're not betrothed, you're not going to the wedding. You understand? That's not in there by accident. The wine is gone. 
We'll cover that in a minute. The groom is able to produce new wine to replace the wine that's gone. How does he do it? He puts water. Water into clay jars. Water into clay jars. Right? There's a few people going, what's he talking about? <laughs> You'll find out soon. Just wanted to get your brain to that place where you think everything will drop into water. Okay, let's start off. It says here in chapter... Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Ah, chapter 11. Oh, sorry, chapter 11. Verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. If you read the other Gospels, he actually does other supernatural things before this. This isn't the first miracle he does. What is it? It's the first miracle with which he reveals his, he does two things, reveals his glory and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of John picks out just seven miracles to focus on. How many miracles did Jesus actually perform? Well, if you understand how the book of Luke begins, and ends rather, remember Luke says all the books in the world would not be enough to record all the things that he did, right? So Jesus is doing hundreds and thousands of healings, and you know, the Holy Spirit only focuses in on seven. So it's in that context that he's saying this, this is a significant miracle. Changing the water to wine is the first one that he reveals his glory and his disciples believe in him. Those two things together. That's why it's important. right? What is glory? When you say glory to God, what do you mean? People say, we do it all the time, especially in the Philippines. They go, oh, give glory to God. Okay, how? What is it? See, we're really good in the church at throwing words around with having not having any idea what it means, and we're so busy not knowing what it means, we don't even think to ask anyone. So you can go through your whole life giving glory to God without actually knowing what does it mean. Anyone? Sorry? No, that's good. Thanks. Sorry? To take him heavily. That is what's known as a perfect answer. So the Greek word is doxa. Have you heard of doxology? So if you ever, if you go to like formal Bible school, and they'll teach you to write doxologies. Doxologies are normally sung, right? And they're normally the very end of the service. And if you sing something that glorifies God, right? A doxology. It comes from this word doxa. But doxa just means heavy. Heavy. So, Raniel, give heavy to God. What? That's what it literally means. And it's a Greek word that's trying to say a Hebrew thing, right? <laughs> because remember, it's written in Greek because that was the universal language of the age like English is now but these are Jews writing to other Jews so they're trying to explain Jewish things in Greek words so the, the Jewish thing is called kavod kavod is much more descriptive because kavod means heavy same as doxa heavy right how do you understand this because everywhere in the Bible, we are told to give heavy to God. What does heavy mean? How can you give heavy to God? Right. But Davina hit the nail on the head perfectly. The idea of it is you must treat him as heavy. The way to understand it is from the, the Ten Commandments. 
do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In English, right? So I don't know how many church people I know who who think that means they're not allowed to use the name of Jesus as a swear word. You know? You know, people go, oh, Jesus, you annoy me. And some person will go, oh, you're not allowed to do that. Actually, that's not what it means at all. Not even slightly. Okay? What does it mean then? Let's go, remember, it's written in Hebrew. Do not take the Shem. Not just his name. Everything that is his entire, the complete package, his character, his very being, his whole Shem, who he is, what he is. His Shem. And besides, what's his name? That's not his name, though. There's hundreds of names for God because he won't give us his actual name. Remember? He refused to give it. So you can't take his name in vain because no one knows what it is. No, no, um, for fear they might accidentally say it, they avoid it. And so all the names of God in Hebrew are descriptions of his Shem. They describe his character. You understand? So you can have um, Adonai Roy, the Lord is my shepherd. That's not his name. That's a description of what he does. So all of those names, you know, you're familiar with them, eh? Heaps of them, right? But they're actually, when you stop and look, none of them are actually names. They're all descriptions of some aspect of his character. So combined, they describe his whole character. They describe his Shem. Remember in Hebrew, name is not just your what it says on your name tag. What about Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ? No. Christ is not a surname. So, so, but no, serious question, right? So, no one would ever have called him Jesus Christ. Even they wouldn't have called him Jesus either, because they would have spoken Aramaic. So they would have called him Yeshua, right? If they were going to call him Christ, Christ is. Greek, right, or Latin and Greek, Christos, right, but it's Greek trying to say <coughs> Messiah, because it means the anointed one, Yeshua ben Yahweh, you know, so in he, in Hebrew or Aramaic, you'll call him Yehoshua or Yeshua HaMashiach, mm-hmm. Jesus the anointed one. So it's still not his name, it's, his, it's a description of who he is, the anointed one. His name, you know, in terms of his friends and his mother calling him for dinner, is Yeshua. But even his name has a meaning that actually describes who he is rather than being a name. Yeshua means God's salvation. Because, I don't know if Joshua's here, but you know... We've done this before, a good place to remember. It starts with Hebrew, Yehoshua. That's the name that gets anglicized as Joshua. Right? Yehoshua, God is our salvation. Yah, God, Hoshia, salvation. So if we pray, we pray to his character. His ah. <laughs> so yeah. So at all times so at all times God never if he has a name like you know, like Mary Lou or, you know, Maurice, he's never told anyone. Nor will he. Because in those cultures there was a sense of having gained some power or knowledge over someone if you had if you had their name. It's like that now, you know. When you know when the police come up to a bunch of youths, what's your name? They don't want to say because somehow giving your name gives power, you know. So in that sense, God will then. He says, "No, no, you get to know me, not my name." Right. So. In that, 
prayer, in that commandment, you shall not take the Shem of the Lord. Means you will not take his character, who he is, not just his name, which you don't know anyway, in vain. In English, it sounds like you won't be, you know, use it as a swear word or something. It's kind of close to the real meaning. The Hebrew meaning is you won't take it lightly. You won't treat it flippantly. But remember, you're not talking about his name now. You're talking about his character. You won't take, it literally means you won't take God lightly. You won't treat God for a fool. You won't think he's an old man who's too slow to realise what you're doing. You know all that? Does that make sense? Do not take the sham of your God lightly. Doxa, or kavod, is the opposite of taking it lightly. You must take him heavily. So heavily that you will not allow yourself to imagine there's anything heavier. No one you should take more seriously, more heavily, more reverently, more fearfully. Understand? That's the meaning of give glory to God. So, when you get these people that think they can make God happy with a rock song, and they just, you know, we, Lord, we glorify you, whilst they're all standing there at a rock concert with a cigarette in one hand and a beer in the other, that's not glorifying him. That's taking him lightly. Do you understand? Neither is standing around in a pointy hat waving incense. How do you take God heavily? You respect him enough to seek to walk according to his instruction. You know, you take him seriously like a father that you actually respect. Does that make sense? Giving God glory is to take him heavily. It's a literal meaning of it. Sorry? So, you, when you pray, you pray to the Father through the Son. Jesus is the High Priest. So he intercedes for us. So you, we, we present our requests, our petitions, to Christ, who presents them to the Father, who will not refuse him anything he wants. Okay, so it's yeah. So, shall I just explain this? Have you got a second? So, when you say in Jesus' name, even that means in Jesus' shame. If you're not praying in His character, He won't answer. If you're really, really angry with someone and say, "Oh Lord, kill that son of a bitch," you know, send a lightning bolt, fry him, you know. Miserable scum. In Jesus' name, fry that miserable bastard. You know? What's God going to do? <laughs> well, I can see one miserable scumbag down there, and it's you. Where's my lightning bolt generator? You know, start running. <laughs> the prayers we're supposed to pray are in his shame. We seek the Father in the character of the Son. That's why we have to humble ourselves, deal with sin in our own lives, approach reverently, and seek him who is holy through the Son who is holy. We approach God in the character of his Son as his disciples. Does that make sense? That's what in his name actually means. Not just sticking in Jesus' name on the end of it as if it was Harry Potter. But people do. I've seen it. Especially in the Name It and Claim It Brigade. You know? They just think they can pray their will and like abracadabra, they can just staple in Jesus' name on the end of it and God will somehow have to do it as if he's handcuffed to, you know? No, it's not what it means. It means the same as it does in the Old Testament. You approach him and you ask things consistent with his character. If you ask something Jesus would ask if he were here in person, ask in, the, ask in the character of Christ and it will be done for you. Does that make sense? That's why God doesn't answer prayers that are wrongly motivated. Because they're not in his shame. 
Anyway, back we go to the wedding. Well, I'll also be in trouble because of the clock. And Lance Cross can reach up and push the minute hand back. Right, right carrying on. Let's go. So that's so. Remember, he his glory is revealed. So that's what's happening at this wedding. When he turns the water to wine, his disciples no longer treat him as just a prophet. Nathaniel always reckon, already recognizes, doesn't he? That remember what Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You know, you are the King of Israel. So Nathaniel's already there. But the rest of the disciples, when they see him turn the water to wine, they start to take him heavily, as heavily as God. Does that make sense? That's what it's saying. Right. We need to crack on or I'll be in trouble. So we're just going to quickly... Remember I said that John, the whole Gospel of John, shows seven signs, and this is them. The one we just looked at, changing water into wine, John 2. He heals the royal official son in Capernaum in John 4. What was special about that? They were in two different towns, one in Cana, one in Capernaum. Jesus didn't go there and heal him. He healed him from a long distance. Remember, the official was going back to his house and on his way the servants came to meet him and said, your son is alive. And he asked, at what hour was he healed? And the servants told him and it was the exact hour that Jesus says to home, your son is alive. You know? That's that one. He heals the paralytic at Bethesda in John 5. That's where the waters are stirred up. Remember we did that re before when we talk about mikvah and living water and all those things. He feeds the 5,000 in John 6. He's our provision. He walks on the water in John 6, proving that he's not subject to the laws of nature. Why? Because he holds the universe in his hands. He's not subject to it. It is subject to him. He heals the man blind from birth. As Messiah, he was, that's in John 9, he restores the sight of those who can't see their way in a dark world. And he, at the last one, the seventh one, in John 11, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, which demonstrates that he has authority even over death itself. Right? And prefigures his own resurrection and ours. So those are the seven of all the hundreds and hundreds of miracles. In John, the Holy Spirit just zeroes in on those seven because all of these glorify him. They show his glory. They show his sovereignty. They show that he's God and not just an anointed prophet. And they cause his disciples to believe him. Does that make sense? So it's not... So in, that's why you'd see thing, um, things in John you don't see in the other Gospels. The things emphasised in John and the things emphasised in the other Gospels because this is the Spirit's testimony through John to teach us things the others don't. But he still didn't touch a dead body because he called Nazareth by name. By name, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, but if you're a Nazarite, not even allowed to be at a funeral or near a, or in a graveyard. So now, where are we? Ah, water into wine. Mm -hmm. So this is the first sign, right? The first. So the first thing we have to understand is because why would God, why does the Holy Spirit want us to understand that changing water into wine is the first of these extra important miracles? What's so important about changing water into something else? Remember Jesus is himself a fulfillment, a fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies, but the one we mentioned before, he has to be like unto Moses. What is the first thing that God allows Moses to do in the public sense? The first thing he does is throws his staff down, right, turns into a snake. But only the, those in the courtroom see that. The one that has the first public demonstration from Moses is to do what? Let's read it. Exodus 7, middle of page 5. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is the Nile with the staff that is in my hand, and it will be turned to blood. 
And Moses struck the water with the staff that God had given him, and the whole Nile turned to blood, and all the fish died, and no one could drink the water, and everything died. So the first miracle for Moses is turning the water into something. And when he did it, everything died. The first miracle for the one like unto Moses is, again, turning water into something. This time it's not blood. This time it's wine. Right? What's the connection between wine and blood? When Moses did it, things died. When Jesus did it, no one died. In fact, it, it, it turns out to be a sign of life. When Moses did it, it turned into an exodus. Remember, God brought, the, God brought them out from under the slavery to Pharaoh out of Egypt. Right? When Jesus did it, it also led to an exodus. What was that exodus? He led them like Moses out from under the feet of the Sanhedrin, the dead the dead religion of the Pharisees. He led them out from that and out from under the power of sin. Remember, he is the good shepherd of Ezekiel 34. He leads the lean sheep out from under the feet of the fat sheep. He leads them to clean water and safe pasture. Exodus. To be delivered out of slavery, to be carried away out of captivity. Both of these miracles initiate a process that results in people being rescued from captivity. Does that make sense? So if, if it's the same thing in all directions except one leads to death, one leads to life, one's blood, one's wine, where do they overlap? How do the blood and the wine line up? Where have you heard blood and wine together before? Well, aren't there a couple of ex-Catholics in here? Well, yeah. So blood and wine should be really familiar to you as two things that go together, right? Let's have a look where. Remember I mentioned the Last Supper? Remember how I said to you that Jesus is going to take a Nazarite vow? Matthew 26. Then he took a cup of wine, obviously, and when he gave thanks... He gave it to them. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. You see the Nazarite vow there? That's it. That's my last drink. I will not drink this cup again. I will not partake from the vine. That's a Nazarite vow. Until I take it with you in the kingdom of my Father. When will he see them again in the kingdom? At the wedding. Here's the, you understand that? So in other words, we're not going to drink this cup again together with him until the wedding. Why the wedding? So this is the part you have to understand a little bit about Passover, which you should do by now, but I'll really explain it in case you're watching and you don't know. This is the fourth cup, right? Remember in the Passover Seder, there's four cups. And from Exodus 6, bottom page 5, from Exodus 6, God makes four promises, and each of the four promises are remembered during the Passover meal by a cup of wine. They are, I will bring you out, I will deliver you, I will redeem you, and I will take you. And it says there, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. Who knows the old Anglican wedding vows? How does it go? I take you to be my wife. And the wife says, I take you to be my husband. It comes from Exodus. When God says, I take you to be my people and I'll be your God, it's a wedding. I have betrothed you to me forever, he says to Israel. The wedding of the Lamb is a wedding in which God takes his people 
as a bride, not just as a betrothed. Understand? You're getting ready for this, mate? We could build a little sin to your wedding vows, no problem. Should only take five or six hours to get through. Easy. Okay, no, we'll, or not, or not. Okay. So this is the fourth cup, remember? How do we know it's the last cup? Because it says in Matthew that after they drank that cup, they sang together and then they went out. So what happens after the fourth cup is you sing the great Hallel. So you sing a whole of Psalm 118, which is really, really long. You sing it together and then that's the end of the meal, right? So that's why we know it's the fourth cup, because it's immediately after that they sang. So the fourth cup, it's a cup of the covenant. What covenant? The wedding contract. It's the cup that points to the wedding of the Lamb. Turning over. Speed up now, I'll try to... So Jesus is telling he won't drink this wedding cup with us until it's actually the wedding. Until it's actually the wedding. You notice the wedding in Cana, how it starts? Go back and if you go back and see how John 2 starts, it says, after three days, or depending on your translation. Why does it bother saying that? Three days after what? It doesn't say. It doesn't say what it's three days after. After they met Nathaniel, that'd be pretty fast for, for Jesus' mother to turn up. Anyway, I don't think it's there by mistake. After three days, is meant to point to something. These things are never accidental. What does three days always mean to us? The resurrection. It's also from Hosea. <coughs> you know, after three days, I will restore you. From Hosea, right? So three days is always God talking about restoration. You know, being drawn back, restored, saved. So this wedding happens on the third day after three days. That's a clue. What well, we already had the clue what time of year it happens. So we know that this wedding is all pointing, the Spirit's pointing us to the real wedding. This is like a uh, like a rehearsal, right? The first sign. What does it mean that the wine ran out? Oh, so you get the thing about the wine and the blood, right? So the blood is represented by the wine in the Passover. So Jesus providing the wine at the wedding is to do with him providing the sacrifice, providing the blood, right? So We'll go on now. Why does the wine run out? Matthew 9, on page 6. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Jesus is the vine. Where are the branches? What's the fruit of the vine? If he's the vine, where are the branches? What does that what's the fruit of that vine? Where does has anyone got any grapes growing? Where do the grapes grow? On the trunk? No on the branches. Where does the fruit appear? On the branches. He's the vine. Where are the branches? Where should the fruit appear? Us. What's the fruit that appears in you? Well, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is, first of all, Christ-like character. That's the first fruit. It doesn't end there. Right? Processed fruit, wine, is what happens when you go past just the character, where the character produces something, which is the deeds, the acts of the saints. The new wine are the acts of the saints, the acts of faith, the acts of faithfulness. You know, testimony, 
good works, all of that. That's the new wine. Do you understand? What is an old wine skin that you can't put new wine into or it'll explode? The Salvation Army is an old wine skin. God can't put his Holy Spirit in it, it'll explode. It's old, it's cracked, it's beyond fixing. He has to make a new wine skin. The old wine skin can't hold new wine. Both will be ruined. If you put a new Christian into a broken old church, they will injure the church and the church will injure them. Both will be ruined. You understand? That's why you never ever in history see God fixing a denomination. He never fixes them. He makes new ones. That's why there's so many. When old wineskins wear out, he makes new ones. You understand? Remember we've done this before about pots. He never fixes pots. He squashes them back in the clay and makes a new pot. He never fixes anything. He replaces it. He's not about repair. He's about new creation. Make sense? Anyway. So, new wine is the, actually the science of the vine, the branch of the vine. Do we keep producing new wine endlessly? I might do something out of water. I will, just for the sake of time. Are you a jar? Question. It's a fair question, isn't it? Are you a jar? Ranul, are you a jar? Yes. You're not a jar? <laughs> You're not a jar. Ah. Well, that's a problem. Because the scripture says that you are... It says that we are treasure in clay jars. Right? The jar itself is not the treasure. The treasure is what's in the clay jar. What's in the clay jar? What's in this clay jar that makes that treasure? Presence of God. It's liquid. It's living water. The presence by the Spirit my mind, living water, in this clay jar, treasure in clay jars. Every every Christian is described as treasure in clay jars, right? It's to do with the temple. I'll, give, I'll teach you that another day. How did Jesus make the new wine? He took clay jars and he had the servant and those jars were set aside for ritual washing to make things clean, to wash things clean with, right? What did he command? Fill them with water. Pour water into them. Does that sound familiar? You know, clay jar, living water poured in. Holy Spirit going in. What do you get when the, you get a clay jar, when God pours the living water in? You get a branch that produces fruit. New wine. Water into wine from a clay jar. It's a picture of us. The clay jars are a picture of us. Jesus commands the water to go into the clay jars. And the end of it is the new, and not just any wine, the best wine. You know? Remember what the wedding guest said? How normally that you have the best wine at the beginning? but now you've brought it out at the end. That also means what Jesus will do at the end is much better than what happened at the beginning. The best wine is at the end. The best wine is at the wedding of the Lamb. Does that make sense? Why does the wine run out? We have to look at John 9. As he went along, I'm skipping over a few things because of the time, but it's easy stuff to read. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? <clears throat> Neither this man or his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now the important bit. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
when no one could work. Remember at the end, I've told you this many times, at the end, as Antichrist rises in power, as the Spirit is taken away to allow Antichrist to come forward, the Holy Spirit will no longer do things in the world. He'll still be in us, a seal, a guarantee, of the, you know. So he'll be in us, but not on us to do any works. He won't be convicting people of sin, he won't do anything. Antichrist will be given license to deal with the world. It's the beginning of judgment, right? Nine. There'll be a famine for the word of God, right? Amos 8. A famine for the hearing of the word of God. That's what the parable of the ten virgins is about. Remember, they didn't get the oil early enough. Night came and they ran out of light. When night comes, you will not be able to get the word, the light. Right? So the branches stop producing fruit. They can't work. No fruit, no new wine. Before the wedding, the wine runs out. Before the wedding of the lamb, the wine supply stops. You understand? But at his own wedding, who supplies it? Us? He does. The wedding that the organisers supplied runs out. So Jesus, who's also the groom, he supplies the wine himself at his wedding, and it's the best wine. What he does in the kingdom makes everything that happened here seem like Diet Coke. Is there anything worse than Diet Coke? I can't think of anything of that. Does that make sense? That's why the wine runs out. It's pointing to what happens before his wedding. If there wasn't, if he didn't provide the wine, there'd be no wedding. Last page. How quickly can we zoom through this? Because unbelievably, I'm over time. <laughs> I'll slow down. Okay, the whole. Of, I think we've covered the whole of the top of page seven. You can read at home or online. That's okay. Oh, just one last thing. Why does Jesus call his mother? When Mary says they run out of wine, what does Jesus say to her? Now, before you answer, you've got to remember, he's a good Jewish boy. What are good Jewish boys like with their mums? Very respectful. So what does he call his dear mother? Woman. Woman. Does that sound like a Jewish boy? No. No. But it's on purpose. Why? What does woman mean? When God says woman, who does he mean? Us. We are the bride. Right? Which, when does he first just use woman? Genesis. Who's he talking to? Eve. When he says that to Adam that you will wrestle with the land to eat, they'll have to toil and labour, right? What does he say to Eve? He says, and you, Eve, no he doesn't, he says woman. Right? He doesn't, he's not being derogative, he's talking about humanity. We're the bride, right? And he says something important. You will suffer pain in childbirth and your desire will be for your husband. Who is the woman? The woman is the body of Christ. What's childbirth? Making disciples. You will suffer, bringing forth new life. Discipleship is a really painful exercise if you're the one doing the discipling. You will endure pain, bringing forth new life. And your desire will be for your husband. Who's that? Jesus. Okay? 
So it's not some misogynist thing. So when, so when Jesus says woman, he's speaking as God. He's speaking to Eve. You know? And what is he saying? It's not yet my time. What does he mean? I know it's a wedding. I know it's the right time of the year and all that. I know the disciples here, but you know what? It's her wedding, not mine. You're asking me to act as Messiah. You're asking me to act as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But it's not my wedding. Right? That's what he means to her. He's not talking to his mother. He's not talking down to his mother. He's talking to us. And if you look in John 7, his, it's just before... Um, it's just before Tabernacle, so his brothers are trying to, to get him to so if you're the Messiah, you have to go up and show yourself. It's the same thing as mothers ask you. Why don't you show yourself? You know, you can do it. Just go up there and show them that you're the Messiah. What does he say? My time is not yet. For you, any time will do. But he has to do everything in order. He has the entire of the law and the testimony to fulfill. And there is a time for everything and everything for its time. Everything will happen not a minute early, not a minute late. Nothing missing. So having said that, what is Mary's response? This is, this is really important to us, right? So she's kind of overstepped the line even though he's her son. You know, she knows who he is because of the angel Gabriel, right? And and she's asked a reasonable question. Come on, son, you're God. Do the wine thing. And he says, woman. You know? So what's her reply? This is really important for us. She doesn't talk back to him. She doesn't question him. She submits straight away, and you tell that because of what she says to the servants. Don't listen to me. Do whatever he says. And because she submitted, because she acknowledged, she glorified him, she took him heavily, even though she's mum. What did he do? He answered her prayer what Maurice was asking us before. She asked in his shed. You know, she asked acknowledging who he is. Humbly, not demanding, not insisting on her own will. So what did he do? He didn't do what he, he didn't decide to have his wedding early. He allowed a preview. A little movie trailer. You know? But you have to have the Holy Spirit to see it. Because that understanding is only revealed by the Spirit. That's why it's in John and not in the others. So everything that happened here revealed his glory and his disciples came to believe in him for the first time. The first of the seven miracles. Water into wine. So you probably didn't learn anything, but hopefully everything you already knew just got a bit clearer. Does that make sense? Okay, so since somewhere in the world it's only half past seven, <laughs> somewhere, oh, hello in the Philippines, I love you at the moment because of there it's probably like four o'clock, so I'm definitely not late. So... <laughs> Let's pray, and um, and I'll pray that I get out of life for being late, but let's see. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Lord, we know we only see in part and understand in part, but even as much as we are able to see by the blessing of your Spirit, Lord, by you fulfilling your promise to teach us yourself, to open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, Lord, to understand the meaning of the Scripture, to be led by you and instructed by you, we pray, Lord, that as meticulous as you were to do all these things, from making sure that Jesus was born in one place, 
went to another place and came out from yet a third place so that all the boxes were ticked according to the prophets. Even down to the wedding being on the third day, all these things, you who were so careful to do everything perfectly, will surely do everything perfectly to the end for our salvation and your own joy. So we put ourselves in your hands, Lord, and we pray and ask to be sanctified. We don't want to be, Lord, like a Christian library, full of interesting things at a library that nobody visits. We don't want to be fruitless branches. So we pray, Lord, that you would water and fertilize everything that you've planted in us and bring forth a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of holiness, and a harvest, Lord, of meaningful acts that lead, Lord, in some way to the salvation and rescue of everyone, Lord, in our lives that can yet be saved. We ask in Jesus' name, according to your good and perfect will. Amen. Amen. On that note, shalom, good night. And, ooh, that was a long prayer because it went from half past seven and suddenly at five.